the ag market team is here to kind of discuss a shortened trading week. I hope everyone enjoyed the three-day weekend. We definitely came out with uh, kind of a summertime volatility, even though it's cold and across the Midwest. Weather in South America continues to garner the trade attention, and we'll take a little bit of a deep dive into that today. We'll also talk a little bit about the CFTC and kind of the fund positions. And then uh, one, of, one of the other topics, we'll kind of dive in real quick. Bill Biederman's going to give us a real quick uh, kind of a macroeconomic uh, discussion. Uh, on the domestic front, weather-wise, I do want to point out, you know, this is a drought monitor. We haven't shown it for a while, but this thing is something we need to kind of keep an eye on. Um, the wheat market did explode higher today. There's multiple things driving it. Uh, your Ukraine fears is one of the headline topics. The other topic to secure technically we held the 200 day moving average on both the Chicago and the Kansas City wheat. I think so technically we found some technical support. And then lastly, I know a lot of producers in the West are definitely worried about the dryness issue in the plains. Right now, there just doesn't seem to be a whole lot of moisture for that neck of the woods. So you might be getting a little bit of weather premium moved into the marketplace, but here's kind of where we are in the United States. But where the market's focus really is right this moment is what's going on in South America. This graph right here is a uh, kind of the root based soil moisture drought indicator. As you can see, when you look at parts of Brazil and Argentina, this drought is still raging. Now, we did get some meaningful rains going in over the weekend, and there is rain on the forecast. Um, but real quick, I want to kind of remind people where we're at. The rains in general are going south. We'll show you that. But look at the bean production. This is Brazilian bean production. You can see Mato Grosso is where the main beans are, Goiás, and then you got Mato Grosso de Sol, Paraná right here. And this is the area that we're a little bit concerned about right now because you'll notice here in the sli upcoming slides, this area continues to miss out on the rain. Corn production, this is your first season corn production. You can see it's more on the eastern part of the country, but this Mato Grosso, where they're fighting to get the beans out where it's too wet, that is where the second season corn is as well as a portion of it is in the Mato Grosso de Sol where they're definitely continuing to see some of this dryness issues, as you can see. When you look at Argentina corn production, you can see Cordoba is obviously their big area for their corn production. First season beans are in the same area as well as their second season beans. So if you look at where we're at on this dryness issues right here, you can see this is where Argentina is seeing that the major drought kick in. And as I said, we did get some critical rains this weekend. Um, this is a uh, slide as compliments of Drew Lerner, World Weather Inc. As you can see, um, you look at where we're at for Argentina rainfall. Here's Paraguay. They did get some pretty good rains. Not everyone got silkers, but we did get rains. But what's interesting, you look at Brazil, um, Mato Grosso, Mato Grosso do Sol, Paranagua, they, they, Paraguay, excuse me, they continue to miss out on the rain. So even though we are getting some of the critical dry issues, issues may be partly taken care of on parts of Argentina. This dryness situation does not seem to, um, you know, like I said, I don't think we're out of the woods yet. Does anybody else have any comments on the South American or U.S. Uh, weather maps before I move on topics? Jim, I, my, I, I read yesterday, I didn't look at it today, that the outlook beyond this week when showers kind of finish up that it could return to dry. Does anybody have updated weather looking out a couple weeks? I, I know some of the weather forecasters are saying as we go into February, they are concerned that the La Nina event bill that we are currently facing will kind of pull us back into a more warmer, drier bias into Argentina as we go into the into the first few weeks of February. So like I said, that's part of why I think, you know, we're definitely not out of this weather play yet, even though there is kind of some million dollar rains that did come over the weekend that may be coming in the next couple of days, but definitely not a uh, closed case. And with that, I'm gonna make a real quick uh, advertisement folks for people who have not signed up for the ag market meetings that are coming up. Uh, Drew Lerner, who provided these charts for us, will be speaking at our Kansas City meeting on February 7th. Uh, BAM Weather Group out of Indianapolis will be speaking about the weather on January 31st. I think if you guys can make it, I'm sure um, you want to put these weather guys on the spot and ask what they're thinking. I'm sure that's what the, they know that's what the farmers are looking at, is what's going to be what we're looking for weather-wise, not just in the United States. The house of South America weather going to play out because we know what happens if they stay dry in parts of Brazil, especially that Safrina corn crop, it could get really interesting going into this summer's growing season. 
Any other comments on the weather market? All right, let's move on topics real quick. Um, this right now, folks, is the CFTC report. We haven't covered it recently in the last couple of weeks, and I kind of wanted to point it out just because of kind of an interesting pattern right now. The fund position has backed off a little bit. They did lighten their positions last week by about 2,700 contracts. But what I think is interesting, guys, is if you look at where they're at, they're pushed back up to where they were back, uh, you know, back toward a record position. So um, we never know what a record position is. But, you know, by historical measures, the funds have really kind of died back into the market, you can see. And as they kind of got in, the market price has responded a little bit. But what I find interesting is the, is, um, the wheat position, some of the other ones. Um, you can see on the Kansas City wheat chart, they've kind of lightened up their wheat position recently, but they're still carrying length in this wheat market. But what's interesting is the last few weeks, the funds are actually short Chicago wheat. So their the funds are short Chicago wheat and long Kansas City wheat. Now, both of these wheat markets exploded higher today, but I want to bring Bill in. Uh, Bill, uh, I know we've talked a couple different times about the Chicago KC wheat spread. When I show you this chart, these graphs between the funds being long KC, short Chicago, does that draw any um, anything to your mind? Uh, it it It's kind of hard to really say, Jim. I mean, my feeling is, is that the funds mostly trade Chicago. I mean, that's where they put the bulk of their uh, positions typically. Uh, but from a spread perspective, it looks to me like, you know, they're, if I could get today's number of their long position, of the long position in hard red versus soft red, I think the bulk of that relationship is all going to be spread related. And I can't imagine to think that if they're about even, uh, which it looks like maybe they might be, that that wouldn't. I could tell you, Bill, the, yeah. the raw numbers, Bill, as of last Tuesday, mine, folks, this is good because it does collect it. They were net long 42,674 hard red, short 27,764 soft red. Well, that tells you the trend. I mean, the big money is going to tr going to trade policy and and big economic statistics, and that is we're going to have a lot of soft red wheat based on the acreage report, and we're not and and the and the weather forecast as Jim just showed you the drought monitor. It the problem is is hard red. I don't think this spread is near over with. Okay. On the beans, um, like I mentioned, you know, the corn position, the funds have definitely put a lot of positions on the corn. On the beans, they're just by historical standards, they, they're definitely a little bit more cautious of uh, applying money into the beans. Um, and then the same thing, you know, kind of, you know, on the meal position, uh, you know, they've added, but, you know, they're nowhere near a record position. Oil, same thing. They've kind of come back into the oil last couple of weeks, but they're not really building into the bean complex compared to the corn complex. I just kind of find that a little bit interesting. Are there any other comments? Um, I know, Matt, you're driving. You got any thoughts on the on the positions of the funds or anything? Well, I think they're, for the longest time, you know, they weren't in the bean uh, market, so to speak. And then, uh, of course, they piled on with this South American weather story. And so, you just kind of wonder if, uh, you know, if, for instance, uh, the forecast would change on a wholesale basis. And I don't know that that's going to be the case, but, you know, I would be interested to see uh, if they would go back to a neutral position there. Uh, but certainly, uh, as far as corn's concerned, uh, to me, it's, it's interesting because uh, at this stage of the game, really, they've played those two markets. Uh, a lot differently than what I would have thought. As long as they were corn, I would have thought that all along they'd have stayed long uh, beans, but that really hasn't been the case as far as the length of the position goes. So I don't know. It's interesting, but I think moving forward, you just got to watch and see what's their trend going to be, you know, as we get closer to our spring time frame. because, uh, you know, if the market continues to be in this sideways trend at some point, I think they're going to lose interest. Well, that's it. I think, you know, the funds are there to make money. If they can't make money, the market stalls out. They may dive to the next market, then try to come back in when it's all said and done. Um, the other thing, and we're going to bring Bill into this, you know, because I know the next thing, Bill, we've got your slides up next. You know, we, we're in an inflationary environment that we haven't seen in, you know, 40 years. And, you know, I still think you got the younger money managers that are out there haven't, you know, haven't seen it. You know, you got money managers in their 50s. Right now, you know, they were kids the last time we saw this kind of inflationary play. 
So I think they're still trying to figure out which way to which way to play and how to play the inflation. Do the old school rules work where, you know, in inflation times you buy things that hurt when they drop on your foot, I think, as the old saying goes. Um, or, you know, how how do you play? Do you buy Bitcoin type of situation? It's just kind of an interesting situation. I think we're in a dynamic that I think a lot of people have estimates and speculative. But the reality is I don't think anybody really has a great feel for uh how this market's going to play out when it's all said and done, at least, and how it reacts specifically to the inflationary front. Um, but with that, I'm going to lead into Bill. I've got your first slide up, um, just showing the inflation graphic. Why don't you uh, take over? Yeah, so uh, this obviously just shows the rate of inflation and how in the last six months it's really taken off. And it's, you know, it's, be it's become a reality instead of just, a, oh, it'll go away kind of thing. And this is you know, going back and looking at charts, this is similar to post uh, depression year, uh, similar to the uh, late 40s, early 50s, and then similar to the 70s, which was followed by the 80s, which most of us in the agricultural sector who are my age remember that very vividly. Um, so that's the only times we've seen a move as fast as this. Now, obviously, this is not as high as some of those or as, as large as some of those other moves. But um, you got to realize that we've progressed a lot in economics. And we the, the feds, if the feds work it correctly, we won't have a move like we had in, in 49 or in like uh, 73 to 74, 75 into 79. We won't have that large of a move. We, we, we may have, we may be seeing uh, it soon. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, the thing that you have to know about inflation is inflation usually starts out uh, with some type of a supply problem. And then it start, and then it moves towards a labor problem. And then it moves towards higher wages. And then everybody starts making more money. And then they start spending money like crazy, like on just crazy, stupid things. Like I need that bigger TV. I need a new car, even though mine only has 20,000 miles, that kind of stuff. And then the last part of the inflation and the core of the inflation and the thing that big money like the Kellogg family type people put their money into in an inflationary environment is hard assets like farmland, uh, buildings, but also food and fuel. We've talked about that many times that that's the core commodities of inflation to the point where all the federal central banks pull those two commodities out of the inflation formula and call what's left core inflation because this, this is what will last forever. So all these other commodities could top out. All these other items like toys and cars could top out. But as long as we've got incredible uh, um, shortage potentials or things like that or fear-driven markets, Food and fuel will last the longest. You got to get to work. So it doesn't matter if you're paying three bucks or four bucks for gas, and it's the same for food. So let's move on. So that seems to be uh, really, really uh, set the stage for you know our commodity market could last a long time, and it could go a lot farther than what we know. And it's just like you know the houses in my neighborhood have gone from three hundred thousand to five hundred thousand. You can't even touch one for five hundred right now. Uh, What's the value of, of our commodities when that kind of thing is happening? You know, we got the same supply of houses. We're going to have roughly the same supply of corn as we did a year ago. But what is it worth? Well, what this chart's telling me is that what's dry, the last thing here that's going to be driving the inflation is probably the government spending. And government spending relative to GDP is at the same levels, and this is a little scary, as we were back in 2008 when we peaked out some of our hard assets and we started to see deflationary pressure. Uh, so we got to watch that. That's going to be key. Another thing, go to the next slide, is disposable income. So what happens to disposable income is we're buying those TVs and cars and having a blast. And this is kind of a blown up version. This is just looking at basically the last 10 years. And you can see where disposable income was peaked out right after all those COVID checks went out. And people were spending just a ton of money on crazy things. That got that inflation thing going. 
uh, now we're starting to see disposable income come down and uh, we're, either they're not getting those extra checks or maybe somebody's not working as many hours. I don't know the situation, it can be a lot of things, but some of it is because the reality is people are going to stores now and they are having to pay more for food. Uh, we're paying more for fuel too when we fill up, but not as much. Boy, Penny and I went to the store the other day and I was in shock at what our, what our bill was for the same stuff we bought a few months back, six months ago. So disposable income shrinks as these core living expenses start to take over your budget, leaving you with less disposable income to go out and buy the fun stuff. This is a key because watch what happens to the next chart. The next chart is going to be consumer confidence. And as our disposable income starts to shrink because real life expenses are taking our money rather than just because we're dumb and out there having fun, uh, as our disposable income shrinks, our consumer confidence also declines. As our consumer confidence declines, we get more serious about, hey, we need to have a budget, otherwise we're gonna go broke. So these are the first indicators that maybe the free marketplace is starting to take its course in reining in the rate of inflation by causing people to maybe slow down spending. That's gonna be the next thing we're gonna to have to watch. Uh, but my point being is this, this inflation thing is really set up to last longer than what the feds originally thought. It looks like it could last all of this year, depending on certain things that affect the availabilities of supply. It could, if we have a problem that causes like a, a weather problem in, in the ag markets, it could cause our markets to go up a lot more because this inflation thing is still a fear factor that we're dealing with. But if we have good crops and we have adequate supplies, the free market indicators of the consumer spending habit is telling us that you know, we need to be kind of careful. If things go good and we end up with decent supplies, we could top these markets out faster than we think. And when you have the funds with massive positions on and they wanna get out, you do not wanna get caught trying to manage the risk of your business in that environment. It's okay to be bullish, but maybe we need to be smart bullish. So I'll leave it at that and see what you guys have to say. Yeah, Jim, I think uh, with what Bill's saying, it kind of goes along well with a lot of what we've talked about over the last uh, couple of months in that, you know, we've got extremely good prices. And I know that, you know, 550 corn for someone who, uh, prepaid their fertilizer looks different than for someone that didn't. Um, but by all means, we've got a lot of folks that are following along that, you know, are in a pretty good situation where 550 corn is quite profitable, uh, you know, and then 1275, $13 soybeans are quite profitable as well. And so, you know, there's gotta be a place in here where a producer, you know, at the very least uh, sets a floor in under a fair amount of, uh, uh, you know, your output. Uh, as much money as we've got wrapped up in these crops, we've got to pay attention to what the potentials are. Now, uh, as Bill suggested, this could last the entire year, but on the same token, uh, nobody knows when things are going to turn south. And so uh, I think we can all sleep a heck of a lot better at night if we've got the worst case scenario uh, quantified on at least a decent chunk of our bushels, you know, with the opportunity to be able to run to the upside just in case. Uh, we do see some of these extravagantly large prices, but uh, bottom line for me is get the risk managed and at least uh, know uh, that we're going to be able to have an awfully good year regardless if the market plummets. Okay, good comments, Matt. Any other comments from the group? Jim, I've been calling people to come to the meeting and while I'm talking to them, we're talking about their budgets. And, um, you know, to me, it makes sense. Almost everybody that I talk to agrees with the idea of if you got to gamble, gamble on your corn bushels and get your bean bushels, at least get a floor locked in. I know, you know, Matt, he's talking about, he rolled up his three ways. So I hope everybody reads the comments from this last weekend, but, you know, we can, 
we can come up with whatever three way you want, or even a min max kind of a thing where we just buy a put sell a call on these beans because the beans are going to pick up the acres. And the only thing that'll absorb that acreage increase is if the South American crop really is bad. But uh, it's going to have to be worse than what USDA is saying right now to absorb that. Okay, well, we are going to, you know, that means one little leeway. I'm going to bring Betsy Jibben in. Uh, Betsy is our media director for Magmark Consulting. Hey, Betsy, can you jump online real quick and just kind of give, I know our conference has come up. I gave kind of a real quick overview here about the weather with Drew. A uh, real quick overview. Um, I know we've got uh, some deadlines for hotel room specials. Can you uh, give everybody a real quick update on that before we wrap everything up? Sure. Okay, to piggyback off what you said, to back up a little bit, we have two winter conferences. Agmarket.net has two winter conferences. The first one is in Indianapolis. That's in January 31st. The second one is in Kansas City. That's February 7th. If you are interested, go to the website, agmarket.net. There's a banner at the top of the page. You click on that. There's instructions on how to RSVP for the conference. But if you're looking for hotel rooms, we do have reduced rates available. If you're looking to go to Indianapolis, that reduced rate ends at the end of the day on Friday. So if you're looking to book a room, make sure you get that at the end of the day of Friday for Indianapolis. And then the KC one that will also close before the conference and we'll get that information to you as well. Uh, that, that one does not close on Friday, but it does close before the conference, as I mentioned. And I know we talked about inflation here a little bit. We talked about weather, but all of these things will be covered at our conferences. We have a great lineup of speakers. We have Brian Burke. He's the president of John Stewart and Associates. He's gonna talk on the grain merchandising side of things. Uh, we also have Dave Hightower with the Hightower Report. I don't have the title of his, of his presentation in front of me, but it talks about whether we're having a bull market or a bear market in 2022 and why. So of course, that's a, that's a hot topic. Then of course, we have all of the co-founders of agmarket.net who are going to speak as well. And then we have a meteorologist at each event. We have Drew Lerner with World Weather Inc. and KC. We have Bam Weather in Indianapolis. And then we have Tyne Morgan of U.S. Farm Reports over in KC. Uh, she's Missouri native as well. So we have a stacked lineup. Great show coming up. So make sure you get a hold of us if we don't get a hold of you to uh, get you signed up. All right. Thank you, Betsy. With that, we'll wrap it up. I do want to make one note, the risk of loss of trading futures and or options is substantial and each investor and or trader must consider whether this is a suitable investment. If you have any questions, call any of the Ag Market team members at 844-424-6758. Hope to see you at our conference. Thank you.